Good afternoon, and welcome to the Today's Dietitian Learning Library webinar, Therapeutic Lifestyle Changes for Pre-Diabetes and Type 2 Diabetes. I'm Leslie Samay, Director of Professional Development at Great Valley Publishing, publishers of Today's Dietitian, and I'm your host for today's webinar. Today's complimentary one-credit continuing education webinar is brought to you with support from Fresh Avocados Love One Today, a leading science-based source of the healthiest reasons and tastiest ways to enjoy fresh avocados. Avocados are a nutrient-dense and deliciously satisfying source of fiber and naturally good fats. They make a perfect addition to your client's meal planning. Be sure to visit loveonetoday.com forward slash diabetes success for your complimentary diabetes resources, including client materials, recipes, research, and free accredited CPE opportunities. Before we start the presentation, I just have a few points of housekeeping. In order to claim your credit, you know you have to remain with us throughout the entire hour-long presentation. Second, at the end of the session, our presenter will be taking questions. If you have a question, please type it in the comments box in your control panel on the left-hand side of your screen. We'll address as many questions as time allows. Third, none of the faculty or planners for this event have any relevant financial relationships with ineligible companies to disclose. An ineligible company includes any entity whose primary business is marketing, producing, selling, reselling, or distributing healthcare products used by or on patients. And finally, in support of improving patient care, Great Valley Publishing is jointly accredited by the Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education, the Accreditation Council for Pharmacy Education, and the American Nurses Credentialing Center to provide continuing education for the healthcare team. This activity will also award credit for dietetics. And now I'm pleased to introduce Vicki Ritalny. Vicki is a nationally recognized registered dietitian nutritionist, life, lifestyle nutrition expert, speaker, writer, and culinary and media consultant. She's the author of two books, The Essential Guide to Healthy Healing Foods and Total Body Diet for Dummies. Vicki's passion is helping others evolve their eating to a healthier place by encouraging them to get into the kitchen with nourishing, empowering foods for a lifetime of health and happiness. She loves to eat well with her husband and two teenage children in Chicago, Illinois. Vicki also hosts a podcast called Nourishing Notes, which gives listeners quick two-minute nutrition tips. Her recipes and writings can be found on her blog, Simple Cravings Real Food. Follow her on Instagram and Twitter at VSR Nutrition or on TikTok at VSR underscore Nutrition. And now I'm pleased to turn it over and welcome my friend, Vicki Ritalny. Thank you so much, Leslie. I'm thrilled to be here today as we round out National Diabetes Awareness Month to discuss therapeutic lifestyle changes for the prevention and treatment of prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. You know, in my practice, I stress the importance of lifestyle changes, and we all know that using food as lifestyle medicine is where it's at. So as you can see, today's objectives are to identify the biomarkers of the diagnosis of prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. Define how lifestyle changes can impact and help patients manage blood sugar levels better. And three, strategize individual lifestyle changes and their role in the prevention, management, and remission of prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. So before we get started, I have a little poll question for everyone. So I'd love for you to take a moment and answer this question. What's the most common type of diabetes? So I'll give you a minute to answer. We've got A, type A diabetes, type 2 diabetes, B, prediabetes, C, gestational diabetes, or D, type 1 diabetes. So the most common type of diabetes. I'll give it another couple of seconds. And I see C. 62% of you said type 2 diabetes and close second with prediabetes, but the actual answer is A, type 2 diabetes. So yes, I knew many of you would know that this was not a trick question. So thank you so much for taking the time. So type 2 diabetes is um, the most common type, and we'll look at the stats right now on the next slide. And as you know, the statistics for diabetes are staggering and continue to climb. 37.3 million people have diabetes, with 90 to 95% of them having type 2 diabetes. And 96 million American adults, one in three, aged 18 and older, have prediabetes. And more than 80% of those people don't know they have it. 
So, and they will develop it within the next five years. So our work is so important. Um, 26.4 million people um, age 65 and older have prediabetes and diabetes is the seventh leading cause of death in the U.S. according to 2019 statistics. So our work is so vital in this area. So when we look at, we know that over time, diabetes can damage the heart, blood vessels, eyes, kidneys, and nerves. And patients with type 2 diabetes typically show abnormalities in their lipid metabolism, such as higher levels of fasting and postprandial triglycerides, higher levels of small density, low density lipoprotein particles, and lower levels of high density lipoprotein cholesterol. So this is why it's imperative that people know if their blood sugar is high. So the risk of type 2 diabetes is determined by an interplay of genetic and metabolic factors. So as we know, ethnicity, family history of diabetes, and previous, previous gestational diabetes combined with older age, overweight and obesity, unhealthy diet, physical inactivity, and smoking increased risk for type 2 diabetes especially. And the American Diabetes Association launched, launched its first test in 1993. The risk test was adapted by a published study and validated using data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. To simplify the test, only health traits that people would know about themselves were included, such as age, height, and weight, but not blood sugar or cholesterol levels. So the CDC actually has a test that you can easily take on their website to determine your risk for prediabetes. So encourage your clients and patients to take the test or do it with them during consultation. You know, it can be very eye-opening and prevent them from getting type 2 diabetes. So only a blood test can validate a diagnosis. It's likely that one third of your patients or clients over 18 have prediabetes or are at risk for type 2 diabetes. So more than 8 in 10 don't know their risk, according to the CDC. So it's up to us to educate them and encourage clients to get their blood sugar checked. Encourage your clients to have their hemoglobin A1C level measured, as that is their average blood sugar over three to six months. And as you can see, below 5.7% is normal. Higher than that, puts people in a pre-diabetic, and then even higher than that, a type 2 diabetic range. So all of these numbers tell a story and trigger us as nutrition professionals to strategize a lifestyle plan for our patients and clients. So whether there's a diagnosis of pre-diabetes or type 2 diabetes, we know that lifestyle change is vital we know that lifestyle change is vital for decreasing risk or helping manage type 2 diabetes. And the World Health Organization, as many other global health organizations, promote a healthy diet, regular physical activity, maintaining a normal body weight, and avoiding tobacco use as ways to prevent or delay the onset of type 2 diabetes. And in the recent White House National Strategy on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health, President Biden set a goal of ending hunger and increasing healthy eating and physical activity by 2030. So fewer Americans experience diet-related diseases, such as type 2 diabetes. So what is a healthy diet in quotes? You know, today we're going to talk about evidence-based nutrition protocols, which have been found to be beneficial for increasing insulin sensitivity and managing blood sugar levels. So type 2 diabetes in particular is very susceptible to lifestyle factors, as you know, and especially diet. With it being the most common type of diabetes in which the body produces insufficient insulin or cannot use it effectively, the pillars of lifestyle medicine really come into play here. So as we know, in recent years, there's been a lot of research on how lifestyle can be used as medicine to prevent and manage chronic disease states such as type 2 diabetes. And the pillars that lifestyle medicine are built on are nutrition, which we're going to talk a lot about today. Plus, I'm going to touch on the evidence supporting some of the other pillars as they're related to prediabetes and type 2 diabetes risk, such as regular physical activity, restorative sleep, stress management, avoidance of risky substances, and positive social connection. 
So I'm sure you all know about the National Diabetes Prevention Program, but just in case you don't know, it was created in 2010 to address the increasing burden of prediabetes and type 2 diabetes in the U.S. It's a national effort that created public-private sector partnerships to provide cost-effective evidence-based interventions to prevent or delay type 2 diabetes. And the CDC supports this lifestyle change program because research shows it works. A randomized control trial showed that completing this lifestyle change program reduced program participants' chance of developing type 2 diabetes by 58% compared to a placebo. And it was even higher, 71% for individuals age 60 and older and nearly twice as much as the reduction among the group taking metformin. So that's really exciting news. And the tenets of the CDC's lifestyle change program is that participant, participants meet once a week for six months and then once a month for a year. And the principles include eating healthy without, without giving up all the food they love, which is what we preach as dietitians. We want people to find the joy in what they're eating, and that's the important piece of this. Um, add at least 150 minutes a week of physical activity. They have stress management support and strategies. Dealing with challenges along the way, which we all know all too well, can really sidetrack people. And then redirecting participants if they fall off track and making them realize it's about progress, not perfection, which is such an important component of lifestyle change. And then let's look at the Diabetes Prevention Program follow-up results. So the Diabetes Prevention Program data showed the weight loss of 5 to 7% of body weight reduced the risk of developing type 2 diabetes by 58% in adults at high risk for the disease. And the 10-year follow-up study, the Diabetes Prevention Program Outcome Study, showed that participants were still one-third less likely to develop type 2 diabetes a decade later than individuals who took a placebo. So those who did develop type 2 diabetes delayed the onset of the disease by about four years, which is, which is fascinating. So the goal of the Diabetes Prevention Program Outcome Study was to study whether the relatively short-term benefits of delaying diabetes demonstrated in the Diabetes Prevention Program would translate into long-lasting impact. And it showed that it did. It was very successful in those areas. So according to the recommendations of the American Diabetes Association, nutrition therapy for adults with diabetes should focus on promoting healthy eating patterns based on key nutrients, varied, selected, and integrated in the right amount, and aiming to maintain a healthy weight and reach optimal levels of hemoglobin A1C, blood pressure, and lipid profiles. And to achieve this, the American Diabetes Association emphasizes that cultural preferences should be considered, as well as the areas where patients live, access to recommended foods, and willingness to change. It refers to maintaining the pleasure of eating, which we all love, and providing the necessary tools to empower patients to establish healthy eating patterns themselves, rather than talking about unique foods or micro and macronutrients. So in this context, a healthy dietary pattern such as the traditional Mediterranean diet, could be the key to obtaining proper control of diabetes. So as dietitians, we know how important individualized care is for our patients and clients. And with diabetes prevention and management, it's a pillar of care. So much so that in the American Diabetes Association Consensus Report, Nutrition Therapy for Adults with Diabetes and Pre-Diabetes, it states that to complement diabetes nutrition therapy, members of the healthcare team can and should provide evidence-based guidance that allows people with diabetes to make healthy food choices that meet their individual needs and optimize their overall health. And we all know this. It's so important to individualize your care, which we know we all do in practice. So let's look at plant-based diets and type 2 diabetes. You know, we know plant-based diets are an important component of a nourishing eating plan. You know, plant-based diets, which are rich in fiber, low in saturated fat, have been found to be beneficial for the, for the prevention and treatment of type 2 diabetes. 
Plus, research shows that plant-based diets are inversely associated with the risk of developing type 2 diabetes. We know why. Plant foods are low in energy density, high in nutrient density, and low in saturated fat, high in fiber, and high in water content. So they're hydrating too, which is vital for blood sugar control. Although more, more long-term intervention trials are needed, mounting evidence supports the view that vegan, vegetarian, and plant-based dietary patterns should be clinically used in both medical and public health contexts to achieve better glycemic control in individuals with type 2 diabetes, as well as treatments for patients with a goal of remission. So one of the biggest benefits of eating plant foods is that they are anti-inflammatory, right? Using a plant-based diet to restore insulin sensitivity and treat type 2 diabetes has the potential to improve other chronic conditions as it reduces inflammation, the unifying mechanism in metabolic, obesity, and cardiovascular disorders. So it's important to educate our patients and clients that whole food, plant-based diets can be used not only for prevention, but also for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. So creating a plant-forward plate is ideal to promote and support healthful eating patterns, emphasizing a variety of nutrient-dense foods in appropriate portion sizes in order to improve overall health and specifically to improve hemoglobin A1C, blood pressure, and cholesterol levels. Also to achieve and maintain body weight goals, delay or prevent complications of the diabetes, and to address individual needs based on personal and cultural preferences, health literacy, and access to healthful foods, willingness and ability to make behavioral changes, as well as barriers to change, which we all face on a daily basis when working with clients. To maintain the pleasure of eating by providing positive messages about food choices while limiting uh, food choices only when indicated by scientific evidence. And to provide the individual with diabetes with practical tools for day-to-day -day meal planning. So when we look at nutrient density on the plate, we all know that nutrient-dense foods are relatively rich in nutrients for the number of calories they contain. And as nutrition professionals, we recommend foods such as vegetables, fruits, whole grains, seafood, eggs, beans, peas, lentils, unsalted nuts and seeds, avocados, fat-free and low-fat dairy products, and lean meats, which are all considered nutrient dense. These foods provide vitamins, minerals, and other nutrients necessary for health with little added sugars, saturated fat, and sodium. Creating meals using nutrient dense food should be the cornerstone of a diabetes diet, and we all know that. Comprehensive reviews and meta analyses suggest a protective effect of moderate alcohol intake on the risk of developing type 2 diabetes, with higher rates of diabetes in alcohol abstainers and heavy consumers. So, moderation is the key with alcohol intake. Your drinking alcohol with food is preferred since blood sugar levels can drop with alcohol intake. So let's look at the Mediterranean diet, because obviously when we talk about, you know, like I just mentioned alcohol, red wine is a part of that protocol, but it's been studied extensively for its impact on uh, blood sugar and the prevention of type 2 diabetes. You know, a 2020 meta-analysis in the journal Nutrients examined the effects of the Mediterranean diet on the incidence or better control of type 2 diabetes. The selected reviews covered more than 100,000 individuals participating in clinical trials and prospective cohort studies. Most of the reviews analyzed the association of type 2 diabetes incidence with the consumption of a Mediterranean diet. And a major part of these studies demonstrated, demonstrated an association between adherence to dietary patterns and a decrease in type 2 diabetes risk. So regarding the analysis of incidents based on the degree of the adherence to the Mediterranean diet, the study showed a reduction of approximately 20% in type 2 diabetes risk with a high score on the Mediterranean diet adherence questionnaire. So specifically, a meta-analysis involving eight cohort studies with a total of over 122,000 individuals 
found that higher adherence to the Mediterranean diet was associated with a 19% lower risk of getting type 2 diabetes, highlighting the long-term protective effects of the Mediterranean diet, which we all know so well, and many of us do recommend a Mediterranean-based approach. So what about fat and type 2 diabetes? It's such a fascinating study. The PREDI-MED study, a large-scale, multi-center controlled randomized trial, reported that a Mediterranean diet rich in unsaturated fat prevented diabetes as compared to a low-fat diet, reducing the risk by 52% in the elderly with a high cardiovascular risk. The interesting thing and a reason to recommend unsaturated fats to our patients is that the beneficial effect was mainly attributed to the overall composition of the dietary pattern, so the type of fat, not to caloric restriction, increased physical activity, or weight loss. So the type of fat really did stand out. So part of lifestyle therapy for people with prediabetes and type 2 diabetes is managing added sugar and carbohydrate intake. But as you know, there's no universal guideline for limiting added sugar intake. You know, the World Health Organization issued guidance recommending an upper limit of free sugars at 10% of calories with an ultimate goal of reducing sugar consumption to 5% of calories. The American Heart Association has recommended even more stringent restrictions on calories from added sugar, with a suggested upper limit of no more than 150 calories of added sugar per day for the average adult male, and no more than 100 calories of added sugar per day for the average adult female. Whereas the Institute of Medicine has established an upper limit of added sugars of 25% of total calories. In contrast to guidelines provided by other organizations, the Institute of Medicine's 25% does not constitute a recommendation per se, but rather an upper limit not to exceed. And you know, the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee recommended a maximum of 10% of total calories from added sugar per day on the basis of studies that compared highest intake with lowest intake and the risk of preventing weight gain, cardiovascular disease, and type 2 diabetes. You know, and research shows that the effects of sugar on overall health are largely dependent on overall diet quality and energy balance. So as we know, it's the total diet that counts. So we all know that diabetes is a complex disease, and it's not only about eating excessive sugar that causes the disease, but it can help to lower added sugar intake to reduce daily calories and, as we know, decrease inflammation in the body that highly processed sugary foods and beverages can cause. People with prediabetes or type 2 diabetes can eat sugar. It's how much they're eating at one time and throughout the day that counts. So I always encourage a low sugar lifestyle. So avoiding pre-sweetened foods. So I tell people add your own sweetness, sweetness with whole and fresh fruits and vegetables, a drizzle of honey, maple syrup, or agave nectar. Check labels for added sugar. So four grams equals one teaspoon of sugar, as we all know. So have your clients really recognize that on a label and what it means and how much added sugar they're actually getting per serving. Avoid sugar-sweetened beverages, so replace these sugar-sweetened beverages or foods with lower or water um, or plain water. Uh, eat smaller portions of sweet foods and beverages, so downsize cakes, cookies, and the size of soda cups or cans really does help. So there are, there's currently a growing interest in herbal remedies due to the side effects associated with oral hypoglycemic agents and insulin used for the treatment of diabetes. So many herbs, such as cinnamon, possess hypoglycemic properties. So because cinnamon contains antioxidants, it has the potential to protect against prediabetes. So it's actually found to reduce insulin resistance. Uh, it contains polyphenolic compounds that have been shown to increase insulin sensitivity, enhances the expression of proteins involved in glucose transport, insulin signaling, and regulated dyslipidemia. Plus, cinnamon has been found to affect the expression of genes related to carbohydrate and lipid metabolism, leading to increased 
insulin sensitivity. Plus, as we know, it tastes really good. I love cinnamon. Cinnamon, which is generally recognized as safe by the United States Food and Drug Administration, is a complementary therapy, and we know it should not be used to replace glucose-lowering medications. So how much cinnamon is a therapeutic dose? You know, according to the U.S. Department of Health, cinnamon appears to be safe for most people when taken by mouth up, up to six grams or te two teaspoons daily for six weeks. That was part of the safety study. The European Food Safety Authority sets the tolerable upper, a uh, daily tolerable intake at about a teaspoon per day. So encourage clients to add a dash of cinnamon daily by sprinkling cinnamon into coffee, oatmeal, chili, yogurt, and on toast. I like to add it to soups, sauces, and marinades too. So I love cinnamon. Plus it can help with blood sugar control, which is great. Let's talk about fiber, because we know that dietary fiber or the non-digestible part of plants does wonders in the body, and it's the same for blood sugar control. Fiber has been found to decrease energy density of foods, increase satiety, decrease weight gain and inflammation too. And insoluble fiber has been found to decrease insulin resistance, which can reduce risk for type 2 diabetes. And many plant foods contain both soluble and insoluble fiber. So more reason for people to eat more vegetables and fruits. So let's look at the therapeutic dose. So fiber is therapeutic for overall health. It's important to encourage our patients and clients to get a daily dose of fiber. The American Diabetes Association recommends that fiber intake in patients with diabetes should match the recommendations for the general population to increase intake to 14 grams of fiber per 1,000 calories daily, or about 25 grams a day for women, and 38 grams a day for men. And the Dietary Guidelines for Americans recommend, as you know, making half of your grains whole grains. So I often have my clients checking the label for whole grains. Results from large prospective cohort studies indicate that especially high intake of insoluble cereal fibers, and in most studies that was over 30 grams a day, or whole grain products, and in uh, studies that was 30 to 40 grams a day of fiber, which were rich in uh, cereal fibers, may reduce insulin resistance and the risk of developing type 2 diabetes by 20 to 30%. So it's significant. So I often talk with my clients about getting enough fiber in their diet. So let's look at beverages and the risk for type 2 diabetes. And it's good news for us coffee drinkers because epidemiological studies concur an inverse association of habitual coffee consumption with the risk of type 2 diabetes. And this association with diabetes risk is as robust as that of other lifestyle factors that have not been tested in randomized long-term trials, such as physical activity, sitting time, sleep duration, and smoking. So long-term effects of habitual coffee consumption appears to maintain proper function of liver and beta cells rather than improve acute metabolic control. So it's the long-term drinking of coffee that can actually help. Um, and obviously, we don't want our clients to overdo coffee intake, but just to let them know that there can be some beneficial effects. And what about water? Drinking water is essential for people with elevated blood sugar because it can help lower blood sugar to be properly hydrated as kidneys are working hard to excrete excess sugar in the urine. So drinking enough water also allows excess sugar to be flushed out of the blood too. If dehydrated, glucose stays in the blood causing hyperglycemia. And just as a general guideline, the National Academy of Medicine, which was formerly the IOM, uh, uh, recommends daily water intake should be 2.7 liters or 11 cups for women and 3.7 liters or 16 cups for men. But as we know, that is uh, individualized and we need to look at many different factors when we recommend water intake. 
Okay, so sunshine vitamin D, as we talk so much about with our clients. A normal level of vitamin D is able to reduce low-grade inflammation, which is a major process in inducing insulin resistance. So vitamin D deficiency belongs to key factors in accelerating the development of insulin resistance and consequently type 2 diabetes. However, vitamin D supplementation aimed at the control of glucose in humans showed controversial effects as some of you may know. Supplementation with high doses of vitamin D is not recommended. However, prevention of vitamin D deficiency and its correction are highly desired, is what the evidence tells us. Although the role of vitamin D in helping to regulate blood glucose remains poorly understood, vitamin D status appears to play a role in the development and treatment of diabetes. So it's possible that optimal levels of serum vitamin D may be different for people at risk for developing diabetes, those with diabetes, and those without diabetes. So I always tell people, aim for the RDA of 600 international units for older persons, 70 and over, 80, 800 international units. So and vitamin D obviously can be found in some foods, not many. But as we know, egg yolks contain vitamin D, fatty fish, once again, getting that fatty fish twice a week, salmon, halibut, tuna, sardines, so important. Fortified milks and yogurt, and some mushrooms contain vitamin D. So those that are exposed to UVB light do have some vitamin D in them. And obviously getting some sunlight. So aim for 10 to 15 minutes at least twice a week without sunscreen. So are we screening our clients and patients for sleep disturbances as it relates to risk for type 2 diabetes? And restorative sleep is a vital component of lifestyle medicine, and it's so important to decrease risk for diabetes. So sleep disorders are significantly more common in persons with diabetes as compared to those without diabetes. Insomnia in people with diabetes are due to multiple factors. You know, many have discomfort or pain associated with peripheral neuropathy, restless leg syndrome, periodic limb movements. Many have rapid changes in blood glucose levels during the night, leading to hypoglycemia or hyperglycemic episodes. So that disrupts their sleep. Nocturia, so frequent urination at night, and associated depression. So when people have depression associated with type 2 diabetes, it can really cause them to not sleep as well. So categories of sleep disturbances that may contribute to type 2 diabetes, and this is really fascinating because when you alter the sleep duration, so less than five to six hours a night is not beneficial or over nine hours a day can contribute to type 2 diabetes. Chronic sleep restriction and excessive sleep, like I just mentioned, can be problematic. Alterations in sleep architecture, so alterations in the basic pattern of normal sleep, really poses a risk for type 2 diabetes. Sleep fragmentation, so you may be sleeping at odd times in the day and not at just at night. Circadian rhythm disorders and disruption, such as shift workers, can really uh, pose a risk for type 2 diabetes. And then obviously, as we know, if people have obstructive sleep apnea. So a recent systematic review and meta-analysis in the journal Sleep Medicine Reviews demonstrated sleep disturbances as a significant risk factor for diabetes. Difficulty initiating sleep increased the risk of type 2 diabetes by 55%, while difficulty maintaining sleep increased its risk by 74%. So it really does go up with sleep disturbances. Chronic and acute sleep deprivation has been shown to impair glucose tolerance and induce an insulin resistant state. So similarly, the risk of developing type 2 diabetes associated with insufficient, less than five hours a day, or excessive sleep duration greater than nine hours a day, or performing shift work was comparable to that of being physically inactive. You know, many of the study authors uh, do uh, different, many, much of the research concluded that sleep disturbances should therefore be systematically considered in guidelines for screening, as well as while making preventative strategies 
for type 2 diabetes management. So sleep is important, as we know. And this is also vital, too. So mindfulness and mind-body practices. Mind and body practices are strongly associated with improvement in glycemic control in patients with two, type 2 diabetes. The overall mean reduction of hemoglobin A1C and fasting blood glucose was clinically significant, suggesting that mind and body practices may be an effective, effective complementary non-pharmacological intervention for type 2 diabetes. And interestingly, yoga showed the biggest impact when done regularly throughout the week. All of you yogis out there, it's amazing for blood sugar control. The stress hormone cortisol is associated with higher blood sugar levels in individuals with type 2 diabetes, suggesting cortisol plays a detrimental role in contributing to hyperglycemia in certain populations. And of course, always recommend that patients and clients consult with their healthcare provider before starting a new physical activity routine. But it's so important and interesting to look at the latest research on mind-body practices and blood sugar because it really is fascinating. So exercise, as we know, exercise is a powerful player in blood sugar control. And physical activity can result in acute improvement of insulin resistance, lasting for two to 72 hours, but it must be regular to have continued beneficial effects. So the American College of Sports Medicine guidelines for physical activity, as we know, are at least 150 minutes per week. So at least 30 minutes, five times per week. And the more muscle mass we have, the better glucose utilization. So the better we use glucose in the body when we have more muscle. All activities count. And as we tell our patients and our clients, do what you enjoy doing, you know, walking, running, biking, taking the stairs, even health training, which I often tell my clients, is exercise. Stretching, and as we just talked about, yoga and Pilates are powerful players in blood sugar control. So people with type 2 diabetes should be considered in remission after sustaining normal blood glucose levels for three months or more, according to a new consensus statement from the American Diabetes Association, the Endocrine Society, and the European Association for the Study of Diabetes in, in the UK. There is still a lot of uncertainty around how long remission will last and what factors are associated with a relapse. So continued follow-up with healthcare team, as we know, is warranted for ongoing monitoring of blood glucose changes and diabetes complications. So the long-term effects of remission on mortality, heart health, and quality of life are not well understood, but it's very promising. So looking at some of this data is, is really, really promising. So it's important to think about getting your patients into remission and having them reap those benefits. So just to summarize, and then I'll be available to take questions, there are seven key takeaways today. So first and foremost, I want you to, to know, and many of you do know, that type 2 diabetes is the most common type of diabetes in which the body produces insufficient insulin or cannot use it effectively. And number two, type 2 diabetes is lifestyle driven, and its causes are largely modifiable, particularly with diet, as we all know. 96 million American adults age 18 or older have prediabetes, so one in three, and over 80% don't know they have it and could develop it within five years. And that's why education is so vital to be working with our clients and to be educating the general population. Number four, weight loss of five to seven percent reduce the risk of developing type 2 diabetes by 58% in adults at high risk for the disease. So that's so promising. And we all know 5 to 7% of body weight loss is not a lot, and it helps that, and it shows promise for our patients that they can really reap those benefits from a small amount of weight loss. The PREDIMED study, a large-scale multi-center controlled randomized trial identifies foods with unsaturated fats to prevent diabetes by 52% in the elderly with high cardiovascular risk. And 
Number six, whole food plant-based diets can be used not only for prevention, but also for treatment of type 2 diabetes. And we've seen it work with our patients and clients. And then lastly, water intake, adequate sleep, mind-body practices, and daily activity can help with blood sugar control. As we all preach and we all know, it's the lifestyle changes that add up to big results. So thank you so much for listening. I really do appreciate it. And I'm here to take questions and open it up to the floor. So thank you. Awesome, Vicki, that was fantastic. We've got a good amount of time for questions. So I appreciate leaving that extra few minutes. Um, I'm gonna jump right in, um, kind of circling back to the beginning of your presentation. Um, which is more of a risk factor for diabetes, body weight or family history of diabetes, if you have any information or commentary on that? Very good question. So which, which is more, um, poses a greater risk, body weight or family history? And I would say, obviously, the current status of your health, because we do all have sort of... Um, we can't all really affect our own health. So body weight actually does pose a risk, not in everybody. I've definitely seen patients that are considered in an overweight range or obese range that do not have type 2 diabetes. So um, there are strong, strong family history ties, and that can also play a role. I would say it's actually kind of based on the individual because there are many people that I have seen that are a higher body weight that do not have elevated blood glucose, but then again, they do have a family history, so they are concerned that down the road they will get type 2 diabetes, so they do work on um, bringing their weight down a bit because there is a family history. So hopefully that answered that question. Great. Yeah, no, that was perfect. Okay, so um, the, the Q&A chat lit up, lit up when you started talking about some of the various diets, Mediterranean, whatnot, um, to help either prevent or control diabetes and prediabetes. First question is, can you address the keto diet for people with type 2 diabetes? Sure, yeah. And the keto diet, because it's so low carbohydrate, and we do monitor carbohydrates, obviously, with diabetes management and you know, obviously uh, prevention, we're looking at the quality of the carbohydrates people take in. So I always talk with people not about eliminating carbohydrates, but thinking about the quality of the calories they're taking in, the quality of the carbohydrates. And obviously because the keto diet is so low carbohydrate, it can influence um, blood sugar management. It definitely does, and a lot of the research does point to that. But is it sustainable? So my big key thing with working with patients is, is the diet sustainable over the long term? And for many people, the keto diet is not as sustainable as a whole food, plant-based approach where you're looking at quality of carbohydrates versus eliminating and bringing the carbohydrate level so low that it's really not effective in the long term. So I, you know, definitely some of the research points to the efficacy of keto and managing type 2 diabetes, but also I like to tell people that really aiming to get high quality carbohydrates that are portion controlled and balancing meals throughout the day is really the most effective approach. Perfect. Okay, so flipping uh, the other side of the coin then for the next question, I guess, is a vegetarian diet too high in carbs to help with blood sugar control? Very good question, and it depends on the vegetarian diet people are following because many times we see clients and they're uh, vegetarians in quotes, but they're not eating a lot of vegetables. They're, they're eating a lot of starchy foods. And in essence, the vegetarian diet should be a lot more plant-based, lots of fruits, vegetables. And obviously, when you're eating either starchier foods, really thinking about moderation and really honing in on the higher quality carbohydrates, which is really what we want to do. So many times I find myself educating the, the patient on actually what the optimal vegetarian diet should look like to manage blood sugar, so or even just for overall health. 
So a lot of times with vegetarians, they may be avoiding or restricting certain carbohydrates for a reason, or they may not realize that they're overeating high starch foods or even a lot of excess saturated fat. And I really kind of educate them that way. So the vegetarian diet actually in its nature is extremely beneficial, uh, but some um, some people practice a vegetarian diet that's very high in refined carbohydrates. So we try try to curtail that and really work on flip flopping that and having them eat more whole grains, more fiber. Because as you see, the fiber research really does point to the benefit of increasing that fiber. 25 to 30 grams a day of dietary fiber is really beneficial for blood glucose control amongst many other metabolic um, endpoints. Great. Okay. I hope so that, sticking, that yeah, you just, that definitely was a, was a, was a perfect answer. Um, sticking in that same kind of area uh, from Lori, can you quantify how much more of an impact or not, I guess, saturated fat has on insulin resistance compared with unsaturated fat. So I guess um, Lori is kind of alluding to a low fat diet in this, uh, in this question. Yes. And a lot of the um, PREDIMED research does look at, you know, low fat versus diets that are higher in unsaturated fats. And like I mentioned, the unsaturated fat protocols really proved to be much more beneficial at reducing diabetes risk and actually keeping blood sugar levels in an optimal range. So saturated fat really, um, they looked at low fat versus diets that are higher in unsaturated fat. So as far as saturated fat goes, it's more, like we say, inflammatory. So we want to look at, okay, what, how can we decrease inflammation in the body and actually that's going to help the overall metabolic process of treating um, type 2 diabetes as well and maybe even preventing. So unsaturated fats are going to be your better bet because they pose that uh, greater chance for anti-inflammatory um, improvement, which is really what we want to look at. Great. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So taking a little bit of a turn here, um, what do you think of, or can you comment on carbohydrate counting versus changing dietary patterns uh, when treating or managing type two? Really good question. Carbohydrate counting does work. So making someone aware that, you know, what 15 grams of carbohydrate looks like or 30 grams of carbohydrate looks like, I like to look at it more as portion control, like how they're portion controlling their carbohydrates per meal is really important because many times clients really get confused if you're telling them, you know, have 45 grams of carbohydrate at X meal and you can have, you know, 60 grams at the next meal. It's a little bit daunting for people. So a lot of times I will talk with them about, you know, half a cup of cooked pasta is 15 grams of carbohydrate, you know, just for example. Um, and many times that's the cue. I'll use a visual for them to actually not really look so much at the numbers of grams of carbohydrate per se, it can work for some, but I do look at the portion control of the, particularly the starchy carbohydrates that they're eating per meal. So it really does help to create that visual plate where they can actually see, you know, how many servings of carbohydrates am I having at this meal? And they, I like them to kind of measure it at home, you know, look at how much a half a cup of pasta or rice or couscous is on their plate, and then they can visualize what one serving looks like. So carb counting can definitely play a role for some people, but I really like to tell people managing the portions and the quality of the carbohydrate because, once again, those whole grains, those less refined carbohydrates are going to give you more fiber, and once again, that thwarts that uh, glucose from going up too high as well. That can help play a big role in diabetes uh, management and prevention. So I, and if someone does have type 2 diabetes, you really want to talk with them about the quality of the carbohydrates, and it's not that they can never have sugar again, 
but how much they're incorporating into their diet and reading those nutrition fact panels and paying attention to grams of added sugar per day. Because as I noted here, a lot of the organizations that we look to have different guidelines on added sugar intake. So what can patients do along those lines? And many times I look at the American Heart Association guidelines of, you know, um, uh, the 150 calories for men and 100 calories for, for um, women as far as the range. But I put it into, you know, teaspoons, six teaspoons a day of added sugar for women and nine teaspoons a day of added sugar for men. And that helps people really look at how much added sugar, how much carbohydrate are they getting in their day. Hopefully right. that helped. That was a little more long-winded than I think the question allowed. <laughs> <laughs> That's totally okay. We've got we've still got ten minutes, so we've got plenty of time. Um, Great. Okay, let's switch gears over to cinnamon. The cinnamon portion of your talk also lit up the Q and A. Um, so, if you know of it, um, is there a specific type of cinnamon that is more beneficial than others, or just plain beneficial, um, considered better uh, in the in terms of how you addressed it in today's talk? You know, in the research I looked at, they didn't point toward a different type, uh, different types of cinnamon. I know there are many different types, you know, Ceylon being one. There's many different types of cinnamon. Um, in the literature that I looked at, they didn't specifically point to um, a specific type of cinnamon. But I know that you can actually find that data elsewhere. Um, but it is important to note that it does have these um, glycemic control effects. So it's important to think about that. And a little goes a long way. So, you know, a, you know, half a teaspoon of cinnamon really can help with glycemic control. Or a sprinkle or two in your foods really can make a difference. Plus, it's got so many other health benefits as well. So, yeah, very good question. I don't have a specific answer for a type of cinnamon, but I do encourage my clients to, um, you know, incorporate cinnamon into their diets however possible. Great. Okay. Um, so uh, why, I'm glad that you said a little bit of cinnamon goes a long way because there's a handful of questions about cinnamon supplements. And so I think mm -hmm. one listener put it best where she said, obviously, we want to recommend food first, but can a supplement be used in an event where, you know, food is, it's not, it's not available to be put in the food or people just don't like it. Uh, what are your thoughts on cinnamon supplements? Yes, it's always tricky with a supplement because as we know, um, they're not as regulated by the FDA supplements. So I do err on the side of caution with recommending supplements. Definitely look for a reputable brand of supplement and also pay attention to the certifications on the label and make sure they're, they're vetted. So when, you know, supplements can play a big role if the patient doesn't have access to cinnamon or maybe they don't like the taste of it or they just, you know, they have some sort of specific aversion to it. So there is definitely um, some efficacy in taking supplement form. I don't know what the actual amount in a supplement would be, but that's why I like to recommend the food first because you can kind of see how much you're getting and not overdoing it as well. So I would really pay attention to um, where your supplements are coming from and also that they have adequate certifications. Great. Okay. Moving on to a different aspect of the cinnamon question. Um, does heat reduce the effectiveness of cinnamon at all? So I guess if you're baking it or cooking it into foods, you know, the question always is, does it sort of lose its uh, impact on what you're using it for? Can you comment at all on that? That's a really good question because some, uh, with some nutrients, yes, you will see specifically in the presence of fat, like with um, carotenoids, you'll see those actually are brought out more. So I, with cinnamon, I have not seen that in the research. So I would say, you know, utilizing it in baked goods and in, um, you know, raw food form can actually play a role in overall health. Uh, the one thing that I like to tell people is you can reduce a lot of the sweeteners in your food with using 
cinnamon or, um, you know, other spices that you enjoy. So I like to tell people it's a great flavor enhancer. So you can actually substitute sugar in, you know, say your coffee, adding cinnamon instead of sugar. So I wouldn't, um, I, I don't know if heat actually does anything to it, but I would say I haven't seen that in the literature. So I would go about uh, recommending that people utilize it however they'd like to. Great. Okay. Unless somebody has something different, you know, unless somebody has read something differently, uh, please, you know, bring that up. Absolutely. Great. Okay, so I'm glad you mentioned um, using cinnamon as maybe a sugar substitute or a sugar alternative. A couple people have asked questions about uh, what are your thoughts regarding sugar substitutes, you know, sort of in general in the context of our talk today, and how do you advise, what do you tell your clients about using sugar substitutes? Very good question, because you can't, you're right, you can't talk about diabetes management and not mention sugar substitutes. So sugar substitutes can play a role, and, you know, obviously um, for calorie control, they are a great way to control calories in, you know, baked goods, and many of them have been really um, heavily vetted and researched and, and used widely in many foods. So they can actually play a role. Some sugar substitutes, you know, that contain sugar alcohols like xylitol, sorbitol, they contain sugar alcohols, which can pose, you know, IBS-type symptoms. Some people get gas, bloating, distension from eating too much sugar alcohol. So, I mean, they are generally recognized as safe if you are, you know, using them in moderation and uh, they can control calories and blood sugar spikes. So I would say if a client is interested in using them, just make sure it's moderately and that they're not, you know, overdoing it with any one specific sugar substitute. But they can, they can play a role in helping manage um, high glucose levels. Great. Okay. Um, in that same vein, um, kind of a two-part question here. Um, one, uh, let me see. I just lost it. I lost my list. Um, here we go. Can you touch on artificial sweeteners and inflammation? Lisa is asking if there's a connection there that you can uh, go into a little bit more detail on. You know what? Not, um, not in the literature I've seen. I mean, in, and obviously, it depends on the individual. It depends on the artificial sweetener because there are quite a few out there. Now, I always tell people, try to stick to the most natural source of sweetener, whether it's stevia, monk fruit, from the plant. Typically, they do add a sugar alcohol to those to because they are so sweet that sometimes they, they kind of thwart that natural sweet flavor a little bit. But I would say as far as inflammation goes, I've seen that one specifically stand out as one that's um, inflammatory if you're using them, once again, in moderation. So I always say, you know, there's one, there's no one miracle food or, or ingredient that you should always be incorporating, but it, it is beneficial to kind of look at the data and look at the research and to see does any one of them pose a risk. And a lot of these studies, they use large amounts of artificial sweeteners in their subjects, and many of them are, you know, rodent studies. So they're not, um, they're not, it's the same as doing a human study, which is a challenge to do, but I would say that uh, as far as inflammation goes, I've seen nothing in the literature that shows they are definitely inflammatory, but it is based on the individual, and some people, um, you know, may have reactions to artificial sweeteners and others may not. So it's important to know the person and even, you know, do some digging yourself and see is there one artificial sweetener that might stand out in that realm. But that's a really Perfect. good question. Absolutely. Makes for a good tailored experience. And in that same vein, again, you've been, you've been really good, Vicki, at um, giving me some good transitions between my questions. Um, <laughs> what types, this will be our last one. We've got about two and a half minutes left. Um, what types of behavior change, strat change strategies do you use? Motivational interviewing, intuitive eating, because we know all of this is really great to talk about, but getting patients and clients to actually implement these things is a whole other the other's part of the story. So are there behavior change strategies that you use that work uh, better or tend to have more effectiveness on your patients? 
that's a really good question. Yeah, and I do a lot of mindful-based eating practices with my clients. So it's, it's intuitive eating sort of approach, but mindfulness where they're really listening to their hunger and fullness, they're paying attention to systematically eating throughout the day, they're more mindful of what's on their plate, and they're keeping logs, of, you know, how they feel after they eat, you know, what are, what do they like to eat, what, what they don't like to eat, because as we know, behavior change happens when people enjoy the foods they're eating versus me telling them exactly what to eat all the time, and they might not be foods that they enjoy. So I want people to enjoy the foods they're eating and really have a hand in meal planning and meal prep. So my protocol really is based on a mindfulness approach, but also the enjoyment around food and really not minimizing food to an unemotional thing. You know, food is emotional. It should be enjoyed. And I want my, you know, patients to think of food as something that nurtures them, that is medicine. So obviously that we're talking about that today, food is medicine. So I do want my clients to walk away thinking, yes, I'm making a difference in my own health with eating, you know, the fruits, the vegetables, the whole grains, and trying to embrace the whole foods approach as much as possible. So I do use a mindful-based eating approach, which really helps people enjoy the taste of their foods, slow down when they're eating, really not multitask and do other things with food. And they really do become more focused on the foods that make them feel good and bring them joy. And to me, that's what we do as dietitians. Food is the center of life. It's the center of health. So I do want to instill that in my patients and clients all the time. And, you know, whether they have diabetes or not, I often tell people adding these foods into your life is a preventive measure for all chronic disease states. So that's important for us to keep in mind. Wonderful. That was a perfect answer, a perfect question to end on. And I just want to thank you, Vicki, for being here today. There was a lot of excitement about the presentation, and we're so glad you could share your expertise on this topic. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you all for listening in. I truly appreciate it. Have a great day. And if your question didn't get answered today, I've got Vicki's contact information up on the screen. Feel free to reach out or follow her on all of her social posts. Uh, excuse me, social channels um, to get more great information. And speaking of great information, what's next? We always talk about what's coming up right at the end of our shows. Next week on Wednesday, December 7th from 2 to 3, Christina Badaracco is going to cover the Farm Bill, Implications for the Food System and Dietetic Practice. She's going to talk about what the Farm Bill is, what it covers, a brief history of it, and how it's changed. Most importantly, she's going to talk about how RDs and their patients are affected by the Farm Bill as both taxpayers and consumers. So this is going to be a different topic and a really excellent um, educational tool for us. Register today at ce.todaysdietitian.com forward slash Farm Bill Webinar. And your attendance certificates are now available to download. Follow the instructions on the screen or you can refer to the last slide of the presentation handout for these same instructions and information on how to complete the evaluation and access your certificate. For our RDs and DTRs in the audience, which is most of you, when recording today's activity in your CDR activity log, please select activity type 102 for activities that are offered by jointly accredited providers. The sphere and the competency choice that you make are at your own discretion. And so with that, we've come to the end of the hour. Thanks everyone for joining us again today. Have a wonderful rest of your day and a great rest of your week.